Let's move on to our next question. Uh, we're going to start talking about coronal plane balancing. Uh, if you're performing an isolated release of the popliteal tendon during a totally arthroplasty, it is most appropriate in which of the following scenarios? A valgus deformity that's tight in extension, a varus deformity tight in extension, a valgus deformity that is tight in flexion, a valgus deformity that's tight in both flexion and extension, or a varus deformity that is tight in flexion? Well, the answer here is the, the most appropriate time to release the popliteus is in a valgus deformity that is tight in flexion. Certainly, the popliteus along with the lateral collateral ligament are the two main stabilizers of your lateral flexion gap. So if you have that valgus deformity that is tight in flexion, selective release of the popliteus is wise. All right, <clears throat> we're going to move on to more coronal balancing. And it's important to realize if in arthritic knees with angular deformity, there may be uh, either contraction or stretching attenuation of either the medial or the lateral ligaments. And it's essential to have an ideal result of total knee replacement that you balance these ligaments in both the coronal and sagittal planes throughout the entire range of flexion. And if we look in angular deformities, on the concave side, the collateral ligaments are typically tight and may need release, whereas on the convex side, they are often stretched and they may need tightening, typically through release of the concave side and use of a thicker tibial insert. I do think, however, when you have angular deformity, it is important to always see if the deformity is passively correctable. In my experience, various deformities are often more fixed and, and do not passively correct, so more ligamentous release is needed. Whereas on valgus deformities, some of them may passively correct quite easily, such that significant lateral releasing is not required. We're going to start with various deformity. And again, with a varus deformity, the concave side is the medial side. So the medial side is tight, and the lateral side or the convex side may be stretched. So when we deal with the varus knee and performing knee arthroplasty, we first must create precise bone cuts. We must release the tight medial side. We must try to tighten any lax lateral ligaments. And we must balance the flexion and extension gaps then after the ligamentous releases by the adjustment of polyethylene bearing thickness. If we look at the release sequence for the varus knee, the first thing I want to share with you is this varies among surgeons. There are a number of structures that can be released. Some of us release them in different sequences. I'm going to share with you this evening how I release the varus knee. Step one is to perform a release of the deep medial collateral ligament to the mid-coronal plane of the tibia, as you see here. And I actually called this my exposure release. I do this type of release in a varus or valgus knee. Is that enough release? I don't know yet. And you subsequently go ahead and do some of your bone resections and then reassess. Step two is to release any medial osteophytes. And remember the key principle. Osteophytes get removed before any substantial soft tissue releases. Because if you first do significant soft tissue releases, to get balance and then remove osteophytes, you may find that you have over-released the ligament. So after I do my exposure release in a varus knee, the first thing that I'll do is go ahead and release the medial, femoral, and tibial osteophytes. And I will tell you, probably one of the most uh, left osteophytes that people forget about is the medial osteophyte that is more posterior and underneath the medial collateral ligament. And a lot of people don't deal with that until they've done the posterior cut of the medial femoral condyle. And they sometimes have over-released. 
So very early on in my exposure of the varus knee, we always put a Z knee retractor underneath the medial collateral ligament, and if there is a significant osteophyte, that is removed very early in the procedure. So <clears throat> step three is to go ahead and release the posterior medial corner or the posterior oblique ligament. Um, subsequently, um, uh, remember you're doing these in sequence. Release of, of ligamentous structures are like going to the barber. And after you've cut it off, it's a little back, a little difficult to put it back on. So you're always going ahead and releasing sequentially and then recess and then reassessing your stability before you go on to the next step. So number one, we've released the deep medial collateral ligament to the mid-coronal plane of the tibia. Step two, we get rid of our medial femoral and tibial osteophytes. If that is not adequate, I'll then extend my release around the posterior medial corner, releasing the posterior oblique ligament, but still saving the semimembranosus at this point. If I'm still tight on the medial side, the next thing that I like to do is what has been described as a medial tibial reduction ostectomy or osteotomy. And obviously, if you remove some of the medial tibia, you will remove some of the tenting of the medial collateral ligament and subsequently loosen it. Well, how do I go ahead and do that? I'll first go ahead after I've resected the tibia and will size the tibia and I will typically take the chosen tibial tray size and I will bring it where it is flush with the lateral cortex of the tibia. And then I will have my assistant mark any remaining medial tibial bone. And if I get to the point where I feel I need to do this procedure, you can subsequently go ahead and remove some of that medial bone with either a saw or an osteotome. And sometimes if my chosen tibial tray fits the tibia perfectly so that there isn't any additional medial bone, you can also subsequently go ahead and downsize your tibia one size and then remove a bit of the medial bone. I will tell you we have subsequently gone ahead and uh, studied our medial tibial reduction ostectomies and found that it has been a very successful procedure in decompressing the medial side and often can save you from having to release the superficial medial tibial collateral ligament, which I think is a very key ligament in knee arthroplasty. The one thing, however, we did occasionally see is on x-rays a few years later, some atrophy of bone underneath the tibial tray where we did the reduction osteotomy. And we believe this most likely is due to thermal necrosis from using the saw. And in these varus knees, a lot of times when you're trimming this medial bone, it's kind of marble-like bone and you can heat. So now I more commonly are doing it uh, with a rongeur, or if the bone is extremely hard, we are always irrigating the saw blade when we are doing a medial tibial reduction ostectomy. What is step five? I think if you have done all of those releases uh, and, and, and you're still tight, if you're planning on saving the posterior cruciate ligament, this may be a time when you want to consider a posterior cruciate ligament release and use substitution if you've done all of those maneuvers and you're still tight. Step six is then I will move to release the semimembranosus. Occasionally I'll release this earlier if I have a significant flexion contracture because again contraction, uh, uh, a, a contracture of the semimembranosus can facilitate flexion contracture of the knee. Again, reassess to see if you need to go to the next step. If that is the case, I will next step seven, pie crust my superficial medial collateral ligament. And it has been initially described like using an 11 blade. I think you can get a little carried away with that. I just usually get out an 18 gauge needle and will just pie crust the, the ligament and often get out a laminar spreader and do some stretching of the ligament in both flexion and extension. 
this takes care of 98% of the total needs I do, even considering the Operation Walk mission work and the 20 plus uh, various, 20 degree various needs that we do. But if you have done all of that, you still don't have balance, then usually you need to consider a complete superficial medial collateral ligament release and even some of the pes and serinus. Again, in my experience, this is rarely required, even in severe varus deformities. Remember the superficial MCL is the stabilizer of your medial flexion gap. So if you totally release it, uh, you've lost medial flexion gap stability and I think you may wanna consider a constrained prosthesis. Leo Whiteside and others have talked about differential release of this ligament. You know, there are kind of two different components of the superficial MCL. Remember the posterior most fibers are typically tight in extension. So if you are tighter in extension than flexion, you can then selectively release more of the posterior fibers of the superficial MCL, whereas the anterior fibers are tight in flexion. And again, if you are only tight in flexion on the medial side, you can selectively release some of the anterior fibers. And I wanna emphasize, don't forget the posterior femoral osteophytes. And I think most surgeons will typically remove these after they have gone ahead and cut the proximal tibia and made the AP cuts of the femur. And I do not recommend this because if you have small posterior osteophytes, I don't think they play a major role. But if you have larger osteophytes, really both of the femur and the tibia, these substantially tent the posterior medial capsule and can affect your balance in both flexion and extension. And I learned that on this x-ray that you see here when we were operating on this patient that had a 25 degree varus knee uh, in Central America. And I worked so hard releasing, releasing, releasing to go ahead and get this 25 degree varus deformity corrected. And in extension, I had it corrected and I thought I was a real good surgeon. Then I went ahead and made my AP cuts and removed all of these osteophytes and said, oh my golly, I have now taken this tight varus knee and they are now unstable medially because I had over-released over the medial soft tissue structures before I had taken out these large osteophytes. So I think these should be removed before you set your AP cutting block. But the problem is they are difficult to get at uh, because of the tightness of your medial flexion gap. And I will just show you this trick that I have done hundreds of times uh, where I go ahead, first size your femur so you have a rough idea on size and then make a preliminary four millimeter ostectomy as you can see in this picture of the poster aspect of the medial femoral condyle. And I've done it on the lateral side in a severe valgus knee with osteophytes. Then you can take a curved osteotome and get that osteophyte removed uh, before you have to go ahead and set your femoral component rotation. I think this is a very important tip that I don't see many surgeons doing and I'd entertain that you consider it when you have large poster osteophytes. <clears throat> now, in the varus knee, if you have lateral gapping, you've got to tighten that. And first of all, if I see a knee that's got lateral gapping, the first thing that I'm gonna do is when I'm making my distal femur and proximal tibial cuts, I'm actually gonna under-resect a bit. And people say, well, should you, should you cut a bit less on the femur or a bit less on the tibia? Remember, if you've got a gap there, you've got to fill that gap. And oftentimes when you see a gap on the convex side and you make your traditional bone cuts, you're up to a 15 millimeter insert to fill that gap. So the first thing you do is consider under resecting both your distal femur and your proximal tibia by a millimeter or two. I like to under resect on both sides in hopes that I'm keeping my joint line more where, it, where, where the good Lord originally placed it. 
Um, number two, if you do have to go ahead and, and thicken your polyethylene bearing to, to take up the gap on that lateral side, I personally will go up to about 15 millimeters. If I'm still loose on the lateral side and I've under-resected my bone a bit and I'm already up to a 15 millimeter bearing, personally, that's when I consider going to a constrained implant to help provide that stability. Because I think when you start getting up in a primary knee replacement to 17.5 or 20 millimeter inserts to tighten that convex gap, you're going to get excessive joint line elevation. So that's just a personal thing that I do in my practice, but I will increase the thickness up to about 15 millimeters. If I still need more than that, I'm often going to, to bail to a constrained prosthesis to avoid excessive joint line elevation. Let's now move on to the valgus side. And here, the lateral side is a concave tight side, and the medial side is stretched. And the goals for the valgus knee are the same as the varus. Precise bone cuts, but here you're going to release the tight lateral side, typically uh, uh, tighten the lax uh, medial side, and again, you still need to balance your gaps, and you do that after you've adjusted the soft tissues by adjusting the polyethylene bearing thickness. I think most of us in releasing the valgus deformity, uh, historically, I was taught to initially release the popliteus and the LCL off the lateral epicondylar region of the femur, and it's very good. Uh, in, re in, in getting your, your valgus deformity release to release those, but those are your two lateral flexion gap stabilizers. So if you do that, you've created a knee that will be unstable in flexion. And Henry Clark and John Insall, also Ron Awat has has also written about a different way of doing it. So number one, remember, osteophyte removal before soft tissue releases. I will then typically cut my extension gap, and if I and I'll put in a spacer block, and if I am tight on the lateral side, the first thing that we'll do is go ahead and release the posterior lateral capsule or the arcuate ligament. And as you can see in this very nice diagram, I typically just take a 15 blade and cut about 15 millimeters uh, parallel with your resected tibia. And this is your arcuate ligament. And I've heard Chet Ranawat say, when you do this, just feel what's tight back there. But the thing that will be tightest, typically in the valgus knee, is that posterior lateral corner. Um, if you need more, particularly if you're still tight in extension, the next is to release the iliotibial band. And you can do this two ways. Uh, one is seen in the got diagram, where you will typically just pie crust. Um, as, as you can see in this diagram, or some people will release the iliotibial band off Gertie's tubercle. Remember, the popliteus is something you will then release if you still remain tight in flexion. What do you do with the LCL in the valgus deformity? Uh, uh, I obviously release this later in my sequence. Some authors prefer to release this structure first if you have a knee that is very tight in both flexion and extension. In my experience in the valgus knee, at least early on in, my, in evaluating, you're often not terribly tight in flexion because in the valgus knee you have a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle to begin with. And number two, the wear in a valgus knee is typically posterior. So I like to wait a little later to release this structure. But should you have a knee that is excessively tight in both flexion and extension, if you release the LCL, it will help release in both flexion and extension. But again, remember, LCL and popliteus, if you release both, your lateral flexion gap stability is lost, and you may need to consider a constrained prosthesis. As far as the medial tightening, in my practice, I use the same principle as lateral tightening in the varus knee. 
I will do in the valgus knee my lateral releases and then increase my polyethylene bearing thickness. But again, when if I require, not in a revision, but in a primary knee, a bearing thickness of greater than 15 millimeters to get adequate uh, medial tension, I will consider a constrained prosthesis to avoid excessively elevating the joint line. Let's talk about flexion contracture. And here, if we look at the anatomy, the concave side is posterior and may need to be released to correct a flexion contracture. How do you get rid of this? What is the sequence? Remember, osteophyte removal before soft tissue release. And here again, I rarely find that I need to release flexion contractures unless they're 15 to 20 degrees or more because the majority of these flexion contractures will have fairly large posterior femoral and posterior tibial osteophytes. And if you simply remove those, often your flexion contracture will go away because remember, these large osteophytes are tenting and functionally shortening your um, poster capsule. If that is not enough, I will typically release a poster capsule. I think whenever you're doing this, you do it with the knee in flexion as your poster neurovascular structures will subsequently fall posteriorly. And I always do it with a Cobb elevator rather than a, a, a sharp cornered uh, osteotome. I like to do it with a more blunt object, always keeping two hands on the instrument to avoid over penetration and, and injury to your neurovascular bundle. If this is not adequate, I will then go ahead and resect a distal, uh, additional distal femoral bone. And lastly, release of the gastrocnemius muscles. I probably haven't done this in 20 years. Uh, probably the only time I have done it in is when we were doing a lot of rheumatoid knees with 40 degree uh, flexion contractures. Sometimes you had to carry your release through the poster capsule as well as release of the gastroc heads, both medially and laterally. Again, do these releases of the poster capsule in 90 degrees of flexion to, to lessen the risk of popliteal uh, neurovascular injury. <clears throat> what about complications of balancing, in particularly in, in the correction of uh, severe valgus knees, but I, I have never seen a perineal nerve palsy uh, unless it was a combined valgus and flexion contracture. These are the patients that are at higher risk of a perineal nerve palsy. Um, should you go ahead uh, and you have one of these severe valgus knees, I am not uh, an advocate of trying to dissect out the perineal nerve to assess tension. I think you can actually uh, affect the blood supply of it. But should your patient, uh, uh, while in recovery room, demonstrate a foot drop consistent with the perineal palsy, and again, this is an important thing for some of the uh, self-assessment exams, what do you do? You first take off the dressing and flex the knee. Flexion of the knee relieves tension on the perineal nerve, and obviously the dressing uh, will go ahead and uh, provide constriction. It is generally recommended not to explore the nerve initially. You usually wait for two to three months to see if function returns. The majority of them will. If it is not, that's when you consider uh, neurologic studies for nerve conduction velocity and possible operative exploration. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.